every second, the sun produces enough energy to satisfy global energy needs for the next half a million years. That's every second. It's a huge amount of power. We're not talking terawatts or petawatts. We're talking Yoda watts. <laughs> That's a real word. It means, <laughs> it means one followed by 24 zeros. I love that word because it captures this huge scale. And it also reminds me of my favorite green Jedi in Star Wars. <laughs> so yeah, you need Jedi powers to try to understand the power produced by the sun. But we on Earth are actually 150 million kilometers away. So we only get a very small fraction of this energy. At our distance and given the size and structure of the Earth, we can calculate that the sun's energy should heat up our Earth to an average temperature of minus 18 degrees centigrade, well below freezing. So this is what we should be looking like, a frozen ball of ice. Luckily, the actual average temperature of Earth is closer to a beautiful 15 degrees centigrade. That's because nature has found an ingenious way to keep us warm. And the first person who figured out how this worked was a famous scientist named Joseph Fourier back in the 1820s. And he conjectured that the atmosphere has gases which can trap heat, and that's what keeps us nice and warm and cozy. And to us, that's pretty obvious. We call this the greenhouse effect today. Actually, it's a pretty amazing idea. The atmosphere forms a really thin layer between the Earth and outer space. If the Earth had been, for example, the size of a fruit like an apple or an orange, the atmosphere would be many times thinner than the skin of the fruit. And yet this barely there sliver of skin is warming our Earth by almost 40 degrees. Pretty crazy. So even Fourier himself didn't quite believe what his conjecture was. So it took another almost 100 years before a completely unrelated experiment gave us some clues to what's really happening here. So here's the experiment. If you shine light on a metal plate, then the energy from the light goes into the electrons in the plate, and the electrons can take that energy and escape the plate. And if the plate is part of a circuit, then these flowing electrons complete the circuit, and you get a current. Again, sounds very reasonable, but actually something strange was observed. The electrons don't always ab uh, absorb the light energy coming in. For certain energies and frequencies of light below a certain level, there is no current at all. No matter how much you put in, how much energy you put in, no matter how long you wait, there's just no current. The electrons say, no, thank you. So what's going on? Well, the key to understanding this is to realize that the incoming energy is not actually continuously flowing in. It's actually coming in packages of energy, quantized light, which we today call photons. If a particular photon has enough energy for the electron to escape, the electron says, gimme, gimme. If the photon's energy is not enough, the electron says, no, thank you. So this idea of quantized light, photons, was an idea that was originally proposed by Albert Einstein. Einstein never got a Nobel Prize for relativity, but he did get a Nobel Prize for explaining this effect, the photoelectric effect because it's really a big, important idea, radically different from the old ways of thinking of energy, light energy, as flowing like water waves. This was really part of the beginning of quantum physics. And in future experiments, it was found that this idea of quantized energy is not just limited to light. You get quantized energies also in matter. For example, if you look at atoms of hydrogen or lithium or sodium, what you see is that these atoms don't absorb or emit a com continuous spectrum of energies. They will pick very specific energies that they can absorb or emit, so you get very specific colors of light that can be absorbed or emitted. And so, for example, let's take um, something like a carbon dioxide molecule. So this kind of a molecule can rotate, and it can also vibrate, and thanks to quantum physics, we can calculate exactly what are the energies corresponding to this rotation and vibration. And it turns out those energies are matched up 
to what we call infrared radiation, which is also called heat. So here's what happens. We now have the ingredients to understand this greenhouse effect. Light from the sun reaches Earth, and it passes straight through the atmosphere. Visible light is not absorbed, otherwise it would be dark on Earth. And the reason for that is that uh, the molecules in the atmosphere, such as uh, oxygen, nitrogen, and carbon dioxide, water, they don't have quantiz quantized energies that match up with the energies of visible light. So the light passes straight through, and then the Earth re-emits that light in the form of uh, mostly infrared radiation, which is heat. And that energy does match with the quantized energies of molecules like carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases. So now we have a picture that is much more complete than what Fourier had. We've all seen plots like this, which shows the increase in temperature of the Earth over time. Also, the increase in carbon dioxide. And Fourier didn't really have the tools to be able to make any real causal connection between the two plots. But now we have a picture at the microscopic level, thanks to quantum theory, which is the most well-tested theory in history. So we can understand and calculate things about this quantum effect. And quantum physics is not just a tool for us to understand the greenhouse effect, but it also means that we can describe the interactions between light and matter, and therefore build technologies that can actually address these questions of the increasing CO2 and how we can reduce that effect. So remember the photoelectric effect. Well, if we look at what's actually happening, you have incoming light, which has been converted into electricity. That is, of course, the principle of the solar cell. And because we have a theory of quantum physics to explain this effect, we can actually describe and calculate the energy structures of different materials. And using those energy structures, we can build better solar cells more efficiently and for, for a lower cost. Because remember, we have an energy source that is producing gigawatts of power in the sky. Even though we don't get all of that energy on Earth, the amount we get, if we tap into just 1% of that, we would easily cover all of our energy needs. And we have the technology to do it today. And we can not just access all that energy, we can also think about ways of reducing our energy use. And there, too, quantum physics gives us solutions. So, for example, 20% of the energy that we use today is used for lighting, just making light, light bulbs. And one of the newest types of lighting that is getting more and more used around the world is LEDs, light-emitting diodes. These also are quantum devices because, again, we know that different materials have different amounts of energies that they can emit. So we can control that so that we can build uh, emitters of light that are energy efficient and can emit in any different color. It's actually quite challenging to be able to make LEDs of different colors. In fact, in the 20, uh, 2014, the Nobel Prize in Physics was awarded for the invention of the blue LED. And this was a huge advance because it meant that we could now design LEDs that can produce white light efficiently and are much more energy savings than regular light bulbs. They, they are able to operate at energy levels that are 5% of current regular light bulbs. So it's a game changer. But we can do even better than that. In my research team, one of the things that we explore is a device called a quantum dot. So we know that in nature we have atoms, and these atoms have different quantized energy levels. But we can't change those energy levels because they are fixed by what nature has built for us. But what if we could actually design these artificial atoms where we could custom, customize what those energy levels are, which means that customizes how much, what light that these devices can absorb and what they can emit. And if we can do this, then we can build better LEDs that produce light the way we want. We can uh, build better solar cells that can actually absorb light that other materials cannot do. So this is very exciting ongoing innovation. But really, we have only scratched the surface of quantum strangeness. 
My favorite quantum strange property is something called entanglement. And that's this amazing idea that if you take three or more, even two or more entangled particles, then if you observe or change one of the particles, that immediately can impact and change the other particles in that entangled network, no matter how far away they are in the universe. It's really strange, but it's true, and it's been verified in experiments. So what we do is we think about how to describe and understand this entanglement. How can we characterize it? How can we quantify it? How can we generate it efficiently? And also how we can build uh, networks of entangled particles like photons, how can we concentrate this entanglement? Because entanglement is like a fuel. It can power new kinds of quantum applications. For example, it's a resource which we can use for large-scale data mining and searches. And that, of course, has huge implications for many fields, such as financial data or health data, but of course also for climate data. The other place which, where surprisingly we see effects of entanglement is in photosynthesis, which is the way that plants can absorb energy and transport it and convert it into other forms. And you know, throughout history we've been copying nature's designs, and we've had a pretty good track record of doing it. So here's another opportunity for us to learn from nature and to find new ways where we can absorb the energy that we need and access it in efficient and cheaper ways so that we can satisfy all our global needs. So really, it's a very good time to be a quantum physicist. <laughs> quantum physics has showed us how nature works at the microscopic level. And it also has shown us how we can use these fundamental laws to build these amazing technologies and address our biggest global challenges. But for me personally, the quantum world has taught me about this exquisite balancing act that nature performs just to have life exist on Earth. Imagine we have this paper-thin shield around our planet that has gases with quantum energies exactly perfectly tuned to absorb just enough heat to keep our oceans liquid and for life to flourish. And just enough so that we're not too warm. Because if we were, we'd have a greenhouse effect that's a runaway effect, and then we would be like Venus, where it is an inferno, where there's, it, it's really hot, I believe around 500 <laughs> degrees. It rains sulfuric acid on Venus, <laughs> but not on Earth. So we humans are the ultimate beneficiaries of this incredibly, perfectly choreographed dance of nature. We are poised on this balancing beam that has been a taken billions of years to create. But we're a little bit shaky. We're not quite well balanced. We may fall off. How can we keep that balance? Well, as I've described, we have quantum technologies that provide us with some solutions. But I think nature has another message for us. Think about the carbon dioxide and the other greenhouse gases in our atmosphere. They actually exist in very small amounts a few hundred parts per million. The carbon dioxide molecules, the ratio of carbon dioxide to all the other molecules in the atmosphere is 10 times less than the population, ratio of the population of Victoria to the rest of Canada. So you may think you are insignificant, but really not. <laughs> Nature has shown us that you can take the smallest amounts, trace elements of matter, and they can actually make huge impact and change the planet. So can we be those trace elements, and can we make tiny actions that collectively change the world? I think we can.